This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. All right. It's uh, time we looked at documents that are found in international trade. And the first one we're going to look at is the International Bills of Exchange. We will come on to Letters of Credit and we'll come on to a document called the Comfort Letter. Um, but we're looking initially at Bills of Exchange, International Bills of Exchange. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if a number of you have never seen or realised that you have seen a Bill of Exchange, but I'll show you one. Just let me get through to the, the bottom of this page where I have included the definition. And just a, a word of forewarning, there is one word in this definition that needs to be amended. It's a mistake that I had not previously seen and it's my fault for a slack proof reading. Anyway, a bill of exchange is an unconditional, this is an unordinary bill of exchange, not an international one. It's an unconditional order in writing, addressed by one person to another, signed by the person giving it, requiring the person to whom it is addressed to pay on demand or at a fixed or determinable future time, a sum certain in money to or to the order of a specified person or to bearer. That is what a bill of exchange is. It's a mouthful, basically. But it's an unconditional order. It says pay. Addressed by one person, that person who is ordering it is called the drawer, requiring the person to whom it is addressed, and that's the drawee to pay blah, 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 some certain money to or to the order of a specified person, and that person is the payee. So these are three of the parties that are involved in bills of exchange. Now, I'm just going to show you a check, which I've just pulled out of my checkbook. I don't know, many of you will not have seen a check before, but that's what a check looks like. You may not be able to make it out, but it says here, it says pay, and it's addressed to the NatWest Bank, and it's signed by me as the drawer. And there's a the space for me to write the name of the person to whom I am making the payment, that's the payee. And here are two lines for me to write in words, the sum of money. And there I write the figure in numbers, and that's the date. Now, this check, satisfies the definition according to the Checks Act of 1957 that says a cheque is a bill of exchange drawn on a banker, so the drawee is a banker, payable on demand. So this cheque is not, I can't predate it, I can't put on the, let's say I'm, I'm recording this on the 1st of August 2017, I can't put on the pay on the 30th of November 2017. It has to be payable on demand. So a cheque is a bill of exchange drawn on a banker, payable on demand, and there you have an example of a blank cheque. I can fill that in, make it payable to you in the sum of £2,000, sign it, and that's me signing it as drawer. The bank is the drawee, and your name there would be the payee. Okay. Now, I mentioned their parties, but we have other parties involved as well. So I'm going to move on, not to here, this next page. I'm just going to move on to the page after, the parties to a bill. I'll come back and we'll look at the difference or the extra bits that are required for it to satisfy the definition of an international bill of exchange. But meanwhile, just let me look at these parties, because when I've looked at these, some of the detail on the previous page hopefully will become a little bit more clear. The drawer, that's me if you remember, I was the one that wrote and signed the check. I will write that check and I will make the money payable to you, you are the payee. The drawee typically would be the drawer's bank, but it doesn't have to be. If somebody else owes me money, let's say John Moffat owes me money, then I will address this bill of exchange to John Moffat and he will be the drawee and I'll say, John, pay you, the, the, the payee. 
Normally, though, it would be the drawers bank, not West in my situation. The pay, that's you. You're the creditor of me. I owe you money. I either get my bank to pay you or I get John Moffat to pay you. The acceptor. If it's John, rather than the bank, if it was John, what I would do is I would draw up the bill of exchange payable to you. And I'd possibly give it to John and say, will you sign this as accepting your liability? You owe me money, I said to John. John, you owe me money and I owe money to this student. So I want you to pay the student direct. Instead of paying me and getting me to pay the student, I want you to pay the student direct. And John will sign the bill, John the drawee will sign the bill as the acceptor. He'll write, accepted, John Moffat. And then we'll send the bill to you. And you get this bill and you think, well, I owe Ken Garrett money. What I can do is I can take this bill of exchange, we'll, we'll use my cheque, and John has signed it, John that West Bank, you can take this and you can sign it on the back and you can put pay Ken Garrett and you sign your name on the back. So you, the payee, becomes the first endorser. And if you're going to endorse it in favour of Ken Garrett, then Ken Garrett becomes the endorsee. Now when Ken gets this, he realises that he owes P2D2, the P2 tutor, he owes P2D2, so Ken will write, pay P2D2, and he'll sign it, Ken Garrett. So Ken, who was the endorsee, now becomes an endorser, and, Ken, and P2D2 becomes the latest endorsee. And as the latest endorsee, he's the one who then enjoys the title of holder, because he's the person who's taken the bill through negotiation. Or is the bearer of a bearable? Now, I've not told you about bearables yet, but P2D2 owes tax tutor. So when P2D2 gets this document from Ken Garrett, and it says pay P2D2, and it's signed Ken Garrett, P2D2, not knowing tax tutor's real name, he just signs it P2D2 and sends it off to tax tutor. Now, because it's not been specified, to whom this bill has now been endorsed. It has become a bearer bill. It has been signed in blank. And now as a bearer bill, this £5,000 document is like a £5 note, but it's worth £5,000. If it's signed in blank, it's a bearer bill. And as a bearer bill, it is worth whatever the value of money is on the face of the bill. So if it says £5 million, that piece of paper is worth £5 million. All right, a guarantor, lastly, a guarantor person, a guarantor in case of need. John Moffat is not a bank, and, and before the banking crisis of not many years ago, banks were deemed to be steady, solid, safe places. So we'll just ignore that political speech for a moment. John is not a bank. John owes me money. I owe you money. I'm telling John to pay you money. But you think, well, I'm not happy about John's credit worthiness. So maybe, instead, you take it to someone else. Maybe you take it to admin. And you get admin to guarantee that John will pay the money when this bill is circulated and eventually comes back to John. So admin is saying, I guarantee that John will pay. And if John won't pay or doesn't pay or refuses to pay, then admin then has the responsibility and takes over the responsibility of payment. So admin, therefore, assumes prime responsibility for the payment of that however much to you. Okay, let's go back then one page. Because we know now what a bill of exchange is.
it's, it's an unconditional order in writing addressed by one person to another, signed by the person giving it, requiring the person to whom it is addressed to pay on demand or at a fixed or determinable future time a sum certain in money to or to the order of a specified person or to bearer. That is what a bill of exchange is. But we need to know about international bills of exchange, so we need a little bit more onto that definition. For it to be classed as an international bill of exchange, it must identify at least two of the following five addresses, and at least two of these addresses should be in different states. It can identify three, but all three cannot be within the same state. One of them has to be in a different state. It can identify five. But if they're all five within the same state, then it's not an international bill. But it can go down as low as two, and so long as they are in different states, then it will satisfy the definition so far as that is concerned. And these addresses are where the bill is drawn up, where the drawer signed it, where the, the, the place where the drawee resides, the place where you reside, the payee and, and your address, or the place where it is to be paid. So those are the five addresses. It doesn't matter, we don't need all five, as long as we have two, and as long as those two are in different states. If we have four, then at least one shall be in a different state than the other three. It could be two, two, it could be one, three, whatever. In addition, it has to bear the words International Bill of Exchange. And that's according to the UNITRAL Convention. UNITRAL, UNCITRAL Convention. I can't get the bill will be sent, now listen, the bill will be sent by me to my bank. Well, I've been thinking about this, and I'm not happy about it. I think what is like, and what does happen with reference to checks, is that I write the check, I put it into the postal system, I'll mail it to you, and then you, unless you want to endorse it in favour of Ken, you will then take it to your bank, your bank gives it to my bank, my bank looks at it and says, you will take money out of Mike's account and we'll pay that money into your bank account. And that's how a cheque works. So the drawer would normally send it to the payee. So in the case of John, without the bank, what I would do is I would pass, I've got two choices, I can either take it to John and say, John, will you accept this before I send it off to, to you? as my payee. John, will you accept it? So John will sign his name, write the word accepted, then I will send it to you. Or I will simply send it to you and you send it to John for acceptance to confirm that John really does think that he owes me money and that I have instructed him to pay you. So I'm not desperately happy about the draw, I will send it to the drawee. I might send it to John, but I might send it to you for you to send to John. And if it's a bank and not John, then I will probably send it to you and get you to send it to your bank and for your bank to send it to my bank. But that's that's the way it can happen. The drawer you will sign it. So John will sign it and he'll sign it accepted, John Marford, and John thus becomes the acceptor. And he assumes prime reliability because he's the one that owed me the money that I have instructed to be paid over to you. By that signature, it becomes the accepted. The accepted bill will then be delivered to you, the drawee's creditor, and in turn, you can, if you wish, you can direct that that money, instead of being now, if you want your, sorry, if you want your money now, instead of at some fixed or determinable future time, which might be 90 days or 120 days into the future. If you want your money now, you can take it to your bank and you can sell it to your bank. Or you can say to Ken, Ken, I owe you 5,200. Will you accept this international bill of exchange drawn by Mike, drawn on John, who has now accepted it, can I pay you this 5,000 and we'll get complete discharge of the amount 5,200 that you owe to Ken? 
So you get the benefits of it straight away. Or you can sell it to the bank. You'd sell it to the bank instead of for 5,000, the bank might only pay you 4,900 because the bank is, is having to wait to collect on that debt. The endorsement, you'll, you'll then sign it in favour of the bank or you'll sign it in favour of Ken, pay Ken Garrett and sign your name. And Ken's in the same position. Ken will say, well, I could do with the money as well. So Ken will sign it, pay Peter Dieter and sign it Ken Garrett. And Peter Dieter will say, pay tax tutor and, and sign it Peter Dieter. And, and so it can go on and, and there can be multiple signatures all on the all on the back of all on the back of this bill of exchange, people can sign it on and on and on. Just a quick word, it's not possible now on UK checks because there's this two words here, account pay, and it means that if I make it payable to you, then it can only be paid to you, the account pay only. So it has to be paid into your bank account and you can't endorse it. But that's relatively recent law within the UK. But an international bill of exchange doesn't have the equivalent law. So you can endorse it, you become the endorser, Ken becomes the endorsee. Ken endorses it, he becomes the endorser, P2D2 becomes the endorsee. And so it goes on and on and on. If it's signed in blank, if you decide not to sign it in favour of Ken, but simply to sign it, very dangerous, because it's now a bearer bill, and it's worth whatever is the face of value written on the front of that bill. If you sign it in blank and somebody steals it from you, then they've got a 5,000 euro note in their hand because you didn't sign it, you didn't endorse it to someone else. You may have signed it in blank and it becomes that much, that much money, that one piece of paper. And whoever takes it, whoever steals it from you, $5,000, Whoever steals it from you then says, oh, I owe my local taxman $5,000. So they go to the taxman and say, there's your money. And the local taxman now has it. Well, this is awkward because whoever signed it in blank has signed away their rights. And these people, the local taxman, are now the bearer of a bearer bill. And therefore they are a holder. And they are assumed to be the rightful holder. And it's only when you contact me and John and all the prior parties, it's only when you say, I've lost that piece of paper, don't pay. So when it does eventually come from the taxman to John for payment, John says, I'm sorry, but I'm instructed not to pay. So then what happens? Well, the taxman comes back to you because you were the one that paid it over. And you come back to, so who has to lose? You have to try and find the thief. It's your fault. It's your, you're to blame. The fact that this $5,000 piece of paper has gone from your possession, you were the one to blame. So the fault, the loss lies with you and it's up to you to find the person who stole it. In this situation, all prior parties who have signed the bill, well, I signed it, didn't I? And John signed it as accepted. I've men signed it as, as guarantor. Um, you signed it in favour of Ken. Ken signed it in favour of P2D2. P2D2 signed it in favour, didn't sign it in favour. I'm sorry, I blamed you, it's P2D2 that, that signed it blank. He passed it on to tax due to tax due to pay the tax on. So, Whoever has signed it, all prior parties who have signed it before it came to the hands of the holder, and the person who passed on the bearer bill, are potentially liable. And the liability goes, it's traced backwards. Where did you, <coughs> who endorsed this to you? And who did you endorse it to? And so it gets traced back. Guarantor in case of need were dealt with, that was admin. I've been guarantees that John will be, uh, John will guarantee, or admin will guarantee that John will pay the bill. We've gone through the parties and we now move on to bills of lading. 
which I didn't mention this night, I mentioned letters of credit and letters of comfort, but bills of lading. These are documents that are given by a, a carrier to the seller, acknowledging that the carrier has taken possession of the goods under this international contract for the sale of goods. The carriers receive the goods and they're placed on board a particular vessel to be taken to a destination port. It evidences the timing of the passing of the goods. The carrier has the document that says, I pass those goods to that carrier on this day at that time. And normally, therefore, the passing of risk, because I've given them to the carrier, they are unconditionally appropriated to the contract, therefore the risk is now yours. Unless we've separately agreed, obviously, that the risk shall not pass at the time, but shall pass at some later time. Bills of lading may be either negotiable or non-negotiable. They may be inland, ocean, or through, or they may be an airways bill, an airway bill. We're looking at negotiable. The person who owns the bill of lading therefore owns the goods. We know that because I've just said so. But it might be a negotiable bill of exchange, in which case you can negotiate on the ownership of those goods. The bill is made out in favour of the seller to say that these goods have been handed by the seller to the carrier. But the seller can negotiate that on. The carrier holds the goods on behalf, seller presents it to the bank to obtain payment and endorses this bill of lading in favour of the bank. So the bank now becomes the uh, beneficiary of the money that will be paid by you upon delivery of those goods. Not negotiable, it means I can't negotiate in favour of the bank, it means I can't, I can't collect the money until you pay. So non-negotiable, a bill is made out in favour of the buyer to whom the carrier must deliver the goods, and all airway bills are non-negotiable. So if it's an airway bill, I can't negotiate it on. So those are non-negotiable, negotiable and non-negotiable. Inland, ocean or through. Inland bill relates to contract over land. Different states, don't forget, it's an international bill of lading. Different states, but over land. No, no transportation by sea is involved. So it could be, it could be from the UK, well, most of the UK, not Northern Ireland. Freight could be from the northern tip of Scotland, right the way down through Scotland, through England, through the Channel Tunnel, into France, and then all the way around to the southern tip of South Africa. No shipping is involved. It's an, in, it's an, an inland bill. It's not an ocean bill. It can go by road all that way. Or from the very tip of Canada, right the way down to Patagonia, to the southern tip of South America. So it relates to contract carriage over land to the international departure. For example, from point of manufacture to shipping point. So a bill of lading which relates only to my production facility up to the point where it is then loaded onto the ship. That would be an inland bill of lading. Or it could be ocean. Contracts from a port in the cellar state to the specific port in your state. So we've got an inland one to my destination, to my departure port, and then another one from departure port to arrival port. Or it could be through. From my production facility right the way through until your uh, arrival port in your state, or even beyond that to your premises. Airway bill relates to contracts for carriage goods by air, and it applies both to domestic as well as to international flights. So, and remember, airway bills are not negotiable. Now, how do they work? Oh, letters of credit, I'm sorry, and letters of credit from routine. Means whereby a seller can get immediate payment for goods. This used to happen in Queen Victoria time. Queen Victoria died in 1901, I think came to the throne in 1839 and died in 1901. And yeah, English people of, of inverted commas, good breeding, 
wealthy people used to do the European tour. So they would they would set up and they'd go to France and then Belgium and Holland and Netherlands and then Germany and, and then Italy and Switzerland. They used to do the European tour as part of the education process of wealthy young, particularly wealthy young men. And they would be given a letter of credit. Uh, so they could go to any bank in one of these other countries and produce the letter of credit and, and the, the bank would give them money according to the value of the letter of credit and then contact the bank of the person that gave them the letter and that other bank in the UK would then transfer money across to the bank that had just forwarded the money or given the money to our traveller. That's basically what they are. It's, it's a way of obtaining money. That means whereby selling an immediate payment for goods sold, but the buyer still enjoys a period of credit. The person buying the goods still has this period of credit available to them. Letter of credit should be arranged before the contract is entered into. Uh, it's not meant to be a surprise. Oh, here's a letter of credit. So, and I shall pay you by letter of credit would be one of the contract clauses. And the mechanism is be the buyer. Buyer's bank as the seller, seller's bank. So, the buyer. There's the buyer. There's the buyer's bank. There's the seller's bank. And there's the seller. Now, instead of simply buyer paying money to the seller, what happens is that the buyer will instruct the buyer's bank to draw up a letter of credit. That's number one, to issue a letter of credit in favour of us, guaranteeing therefore that S will be paid. The buyer's bank then contacts the seller's bank to advise that the letter has been issued. And the seller's bank agrees to handle their side of the, the process. So they're accepting that it's their responsibility to make sure that everything goes smoothly at the seller's end of the contract, at the seller's end of the payment. Then the seller sends proof. The seller's bank will tell the seller, listen, we've received this letter of credit in favour of you, so we need you to prove to us that delivery has been made. So the seller gives proof of delivery, That's number five. And then the seller's bank pays the seller. So there's very little delay in the seller getting payment for the goods. They have delivered them, and then the seller's bank will pay the seller. But you see, the seller's bank is now out of money. So what that has to do, the seller's bank will pay us and then sends this proof of delivery to the buyer's bank and says to the buyer's bank, there we are, there's proof of delivery, so can you now pay us? So the buyer's bank pays the seller's bank, so the seller's bank is not out of pocket. But now the buyer's bank is out of pocket. So the buyer's bank notifies the buyer and says, we just have to pay out. So they would notifies, so they will now deduct the money from the buyer's account and the buyer then effectively pays the buyer's bank out of the buyer's account. So that's how it works. The buyer instructs the buyer's bank to make a letter of credit in favour of the seller and sends it to the seller's bank. The seller's bank notifies the seller and says, if you will prove delivery, then we'll give you money. So the seller proves delivery and the seller's bank pays into the seller's account. Meanwhile, the seller's bank pays, or oh, sorry, sends the proof of delivery, the documentation, sends the documentation through to the buyer's bank and the buyer's bank says, okay, well, there's the money and we'll take it out of the buyer's account. And they do so and they notify the buyer and say, We've, there's your documentation proving delivery uh, and we have taken the money out of your account to compensate, to reimburse us because we've had to pay out on your debt. 
That's how the letter of credit works. And don't I think it's possible? I've never done that before. I've never drawn it out like that before. Um, and I don't know whether it makes it any clearer for you. But it saves that, doesn't it? <laughs> it saves it saves the buyer having to say having to pay the seller. I'm sorry. How which is more complicated? And who makes money out of this transaction? Well, clearly the buyer's bank is going to make money and the seller's bank is going to make money. And do you not think that bankers make enough money without you having to go through this, this round, round and roundabout process? Why not just uh, send an international bill of exchange that says pay the seller in 90 days? I don't know. Anyway, letters of credit may be confirmed or unconfirmed. It's at this stage, step four. Step four, if you remember, step four is where the seller's bank agrees to handle their end of the process. We advise the issue of the letter and the seller's bank says, yes, okay, we'll deal with it. So the seller's bank is confirming that, yes, okay, we can carry on and, and we will deal with our end of it. Unconfirmed, the seller's bank doesn't add its own confirmation. The seller's bank is not guaranteeing therefore, that the seller will be paid. And herein lies a problem. A letter of credit may be revocable or irrevocable. If it's revocable, it gives the buyer the opportunity to change the details. And I'm not sure of the process of how that happens, but it is available, apparently, for the buyer to change the details. At what stage through this process, I don't know. But if it's a revocable, letter of credit, then the buyer has the opportunity to renege on the deal. And that being so, it's not a particularly secure way for the seller to negotiate payment. If it's irrevocable, then the seller will be paid and the buyer cannot amend the details. If we move on, letters of comfort. I always felt that this was a misnomer. A misnomer because auditors used to ask for this. When I was a, an audit student, when I was training to be an accountant, we always used to get a letter, a letter of comfort from the parent company. Um, and typically, this would happen where there was a subsidiary which was being audited, and the subsidiary, to, subsidiary was in a financially difficult position. So, what we would do would, would in order to allay our fears about the subsidiary not being a going concern, we get this letter of comfort from the parent company. We, the directors of the parent company, indicate that it is our intention fully to support our subsidiary through its time of financial crisis. And that would be a letter of comfort for the auditors. This is what a letter of comfort is. Typically, it's a letter signed by the board of the parent company to confirm that they will continue to support their insolvent subsidiary. A place involving groups of companies, written by a parent holding company indicating intention to support subsidiary, typically subsidiaries insolvent or trying to raise finance. It's just a comfort. No legal liability involved. The issuance of this comfort letter is our intention fully to support our subsidiary in its times of need has no legal binding effect. So when the subsidiary does declare an insolvent liquidation, the parent directors say, well, it was our intention to support, but things change, you know. There's no legal liability. So it's a comfort. How much comfort is a letter of comfort? Well, you tell me. How much comfort should you as an auditor get when a parent company says it is our intention? Blah, 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 blah. And you're quite right. Very little. 